long lay in wait, an immense and ancient inland lake between the Andes and the Caribbean. Today, it's one of the world's most treasured wetlands. The Llanos, an emerald oasis crowned by scarlet skies. Venezuela, that's what the first explorers called it, Little Venice. And at certain times, this country possesses all the watery charm of its Italian namesake. This is the story of a year in the life of this land. One marked by profound metamorphosis, from lush paradise to searing dusty plain. The masters of the marsh are those who come and go as they please, born on the wind. Others are slaves to the seasons, the deadly drought or the fertile flood. The Llanos is one of the most biologically diverse lands in South America. Venezuela may be best known for its 3,000 kilometers of Caribbean beach, but the Llanos covers almost a third of its landscape. It all begins with the winter rains. The plains fill to the brim, a reminder of the vast lake that once lay here. Some have to take to higher ground to keep their feet from getting wet. But life is more neighborly down on the ground. There, the shimmering surface hides a sumptuous feast. A rainbow of birds from more than a thousand different species may stop here for a sip of liquid breakfast. Like the rosy apparition of dawn itself, the Scarlet Ibis joins the banquet. Tracing its ancestry back 60 million years, it's an ancient bird with a far-flung history. Its white feathered cousins are found on five continents. But only in crustacean-rich waters like the Llanos does the ibis reach its full scarlet glory. For the carotene in shellfish makes the bird's naturally pink plumage blush to a brazen hue. While its color sets it apart, the secret of the ibis's success is its long curved beak. Like its relative, the heron, it plums the muddy bottom for dinner. But different beaks seek different things. Each shape is uniquely adapted for specific prey. The bird's varied hunting habits assure that there's plenty for all. But food isn't the only thing on their minds. Just as the rains have brought the Llanos to life, so nature now calls its creatures to breed.
The Breakfast Club shares not just feeding grounds, but also a nesting colony. For the chicks, there's safety in numbers. The great white heron brings its young both piranha and perch. The roseate spoonbill also looks for dinner. At the tip of her spoon-shaped bill are sensitive nerve endings which help her detect food. Many birds are just visitors in these parts. But the ibis is a year-round Venezuelan. Its chick is an ugly duckling indeed. There's no hint of the beauty it will become. All ibises, white, green, or scarlet, start out as a muddy black. The crimson color is revealed only when the bird reaches maturity around two years old. Ibises mate for life and raise two or three young at a time. For nearly a month, both parents hunt tirelessly to feed the hungry brood. The chick's greedy badgering is more than bad manners. Their assault triggers the adult to regurgitate dinner for them. At about four weeks, they too will take to the skies. Tough times are on the way. The rains that have fallen for seven months suddenly cease. By March, the ghost of that ancient lake has vanished leaving only shrinking water holes separated by mud flats and prairie grass. Now is the season of the Llaneros. Stories about the courageous barefoot cowboys date back to the 16th century when Spanish ranchers first settled here. The flood's retreat is a boon to them, opening up ranges that are usually submerged. But for others, the dry season can be deadly. Their misfortune is the stock in trade of the lesser yellow-headed vulture. King vultures, too, are ever at hand, waiting for the extreme conditions to take their toll. 
From great distances across the plains, they detect carrion by exceptional sight and smell. Each animal must find its own way of dealing with the blazing temperatures. Burrowing owls dig caves in the cool earth where they avoid the worst heat of the day. Others sensibly stay poolside even if now they're barely wading pools. As in a busy restaurant, the water hole's clientele is constantly changing. Parrots are among the area's most endangered birds victims of the booming black market in exotic animals. Snowy egrets, too, are increasingly rare. Limpkins escape such carnage. They're just making a pit stop in their long migration to the Arctic. But for visitors and residents alike, other dangers are close at hand. At two meters long, the caiman may be one of the smallest crocs, but it's still a top predator in these parts. A mature adult hunts birds, reptiles, and even wild pigs. Though he looks hungry at the moment, this one's no real threat. Crocodiles rest with their mouths open. In the Llanos, caiman numbers have been decreasing in recent years. Their skins have become popular among hunters as other crocodile species have declined. But caimans don't offer their own kind much help in the struggle to survive. As hatchlings, these caimans were abandoned shortly before the dry season and saved from nearly certain death. When the Llanos begins to evaporate, caimans will cannibalize other caimans in an effort to protect precious water rights. While caimans rule the waters of the Llanos, locals call the capybaras the lords of the grass, a grand name for a creature that looks a lot like a giant guinea pig. With their webbed toes, they've adapted well to life in the Llanos. They even sleep underwater with just their noses poking out above the surface. Their attachment to water was a good defense against their old feline enemies like pumas and jaguars. But it has proven to be their undoing in modern times. In the 16th century, settlers asked the Pope to declare that capybaras are fish so they could be eaten during Lent. It's a bizarre twist of fate for the largest rodent in the world. Today, several thousand animals are culled each year during the weeks before Easter. The Hoatzin bird has avoided being served for dinner because of what amounts to bad breath. Though its meat is supposedly an aphrodisiac, locals won't touch it. Its ancestors roamed this region when it was still completely underwater. The past several million years haven't improved the bird's digestive system much. 
Leaves, decomposing in a chamber near its mouth, produce an unappetizing smell reminiscent of cow manure. Leaves are also the main course for the howler monkey. It's unusual fare for a primate, but a practical choice in the Llanos, where foliage is more plentiful than flowers or fruit. A specialized digestive system helps the monkeys break down the fibrous cellulose. Their diet has its drawbacks, though. Leaves are sugar poor, making them a low energy snack. Dozing half the day away, the monkeys seem downright lazy, but they're actually just conserving their strength. Loud howl itself contributes to energy conservation. Their chorus alerts other troops of their whereabouts, preventing territorial squabbles, and it's much less exhausting to scream than patrol the home range all day. Fortunately for them, howler monkeys have one of the loudest cries in nature and little chance of going hoarse. The ratio of their voice box to body size is ten times greater than that of humans. For those who spend most of their day hanging from the highest branches, it helps to have an extra arm. The powerful tail of the howler monkey gives it free use of its hands. A cunning adaptation, this swinging tail is found only in New World primates. Moving from tree to tree, howler babies stay with their birth troop until they are forced out by the dominant male. But they are not the only ones thinking about new horizons. The dry season has parched every last pool. Many creatures are desperate now to reach greener climes. In the mosquito-ridden swamps a few hundred miles north of the Llanos, scarlet ibises can be found in the shade of the mangroves. Though ibis plumage is naturally red, it will intensify based on the amount of carotene in their food supply. The quality here is evidenced by the intense vermilion color of their feathers. In nearby coastal waters, they're joined by spoonbills, cranes, and flamingos. With much of its human population under the age of 30, the urban sprawl on Venezuela's coast is out of control. The ibises still feed here, on snails, mussels, and crabs, though pollution has taken its toll.
but they will not breed. Civilization's encroachment is too unsettling for nesting. Oil slicks from leaky pipelines and runoff from mining and agricultural operations is quickly killing aquatic life and those who make a living from it. If the current pace of development continues, all the shades of red may one day be drained from Venezuela's shore. Yet, in the inland haven called the Llanos, nature still holds its own. The punishing season of drought drives all but the toughest away. Those that endure wait every year for the ghost lake to renew itself. While the dust defers to the drenching rains, a whole world emerges and reunites. And as these waters swell with life, the skies again are streaked with scarlet. 